you know, for those who just joined, um, before you joined, uh, I was mentioning to Paul, um, I was a little embarrassed when I met the crew here that with, with all the time that I've had in uh, AEC that I did not know uh, that well building standards even existed. And um, kind of funny story on that. You instinctually know that space matters. And there, there was a time where I was in a hospital for an extended period of time. And it was a kind of a dark moment in my life. And I don't remember or hardly remember anything about that time except one vivid detail. And it was these disgusting white or sorry, pink concrete cold walls. Like I, I remember calling it aggressive salmon. I'm like, these aggressive salmon colored walls are just driving me nuts. I wanted to do anything I could to escape this hospital. So I think it was kind of funny that I, I was ready. I couldn't walk at the time, but I was ready to do whatever I could to get out of the hospital. And it was, had to do with the walls. It was like one of the only things that I remember from that whole experience. It was crazy. So meeting Sarah, Nick, uh, and, and Cal has been an eye opener. Um, and, you know, I'm stoked to be able to introduce them because high performance tactics are a real passion of mine. And if you have a bad environment, um, the high performance tactics might, are, are about as useful as a, an umbrella in a hurricane. So uh, on that note, man, I'm really proud to introduce the three of you. Uh, Sarah, welcome. Um, for everyone else, uh, Sarah is, um, she's the VP of um, International Well Building Institute's uh, commercial team. Um, she's personally led, uh, led a movement that has created the, the well building standards and its internationalization, like literally bringing the standards across the globe. She plays a, a critical role. In, uh, in health and wellness movement in uh, environmental, social, and the, and the government uh, gov governance landscape. Um, she's uh, well-versed and kind of masterful in, in helping the investment community understand why they should be pumping up the volume in this. Um, she's got a, a, a dual master's degree in public health uh, and urban planning, a bachelor of arts in financing. She's a triathlon coach uh, and a yoga instructor and a soon-to-be mom. <clears throat> Did I get all that? <laughs> so she's basically the international badass of well-being. Um, uh, Nick and Cal, I have to introduce these two together as a pair because they both work under the same umbrella at Holmes and Murphy, so they're colleagues. They're, uh, they're co-authoring uh, a series on incorporating mental, uh, mental well-being into, um, into building design. Uh, and it's, it's been rumored that Cal is actually, or may have been Nick's uh, little league coach. It's not necessarily confirmed, but it's rumored. Um, so, uh, more specifically, uh, Nick, Nick is one of those guys that will graduate at the top of the class. Um, he is a servant to everyone else around him. Um, just an all-around nice guy uh, and you won't hear anything about it because he's too humble and I say that because I had to dig to find out those things about him and he's an account manager and a shareholder at uh, Holmes and Murphy and uh, where's their mission statement um, this says it all hold on Holmes and Murphy their mission statement we make a difference by promoting health protecting wealth and delivering peace of mind so boom love it uh, that says it all about that company. And um, Cal, what can I say about him? Man, met him a while ago. Uh, stellar, badass dude. Love the guy. And his experience, he's over 10 years with the uh, National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. So he's literally saving lives with proactive suicide prevention strategies. Um, he's also an expert advisor uh, he's on the expert advisory group for, uh, for workplace health uh, at the American uh, Psychiatric uh, Association. Um, he's done a tremendous amount of research. Um, he's got uh, phenomenal presentation skills, peer review skills, all of which really expedites these types of important conversations. And we all know that it's starting these conversations that makes a difference. So Cal, uh, uh, Cal's skills are really helping 
all of us, the more people that he touches, the more people that are able to take these conversations to the level that at, where, where a difference is actually going to be made. So, the, the, I mean, man, that's our group of uh, experts today. Um, Cal, Nick, did I miss anything? Any of you guys want to add? No. There's no, there's no truth to the Little League coach. It's what Nick and I say. We built this partnership. I met Nick actually uh, almost seven years ago at an insurance training class. And uh, he was at the head of the class, the brightest person, the most skilled, the most composed, um, the most genuine. When I showed up at, uh, at my company, CSDZ, which is owned by his parent company, um, I knew when the announcement came, he would be the first person to call. Every person I meet at this organization knows Nick. And now it's just kind of a joke between us. Hey, do you know Nick Maletta? How do you know Nick? <laughs> and so I'm old enough to be his father, right? And so we came up with this story, if we had to, that I was either his football coach or his uh, baseball coach. <laughs> and we just have fun with it. But uh, thanks, Chad. Yep. I knew <laughs> but, you'd love that. I had to squeeze that yes, in. Yes, thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> the thing that's powerful is what Nick does every day with architects and engineers. This topic of uh, the built environment, um, him connecting you guys to uh, to Sarah is huge. And um, I'm just along for the ride today. So that's all for me. Thank you, Chad. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you think you are, but I'm bringing you in. Um, <laughs> on that note, awesome segue, uh, Sarah. Um, we had a great introductory conversation and read some of your uh, resources that you, had, um, that you had sent, which has been really inspiring and eye-opening. Um, I thought we'd start off the conversation with you just introducing us just to the topic of uh, biophilia and uh, biomimicry. Um, yes, can you guys hear me okay? Good to go. Uh, and yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I love these uh, smiling faces and, and I'm humbled to be among these two badasses. So thank you for the, uh, thank you for letting me join the conversation. Um, yeah, I actually, I think the, the importance of, and I'm sorry if you can hear my husband in the background, he's louder than, um, than I would like him to be, but we'll keep him anyways. Um, we, you know, the, the, the sort of this, this experience that we're all, you know, uh, going through together, sort of this alone together um, concept has probably highlighted the importance of the outdoors and what we, what we feel like we're missing, right? And um, I know I will actually use him as a really good example. Um, there are many days that he'll wake up and literally won't leave the house. Um, and despite the fact that, you know, he's married to someone who like, you know, asks him to leave and it's, it's, I mean, that like, I want him to get outside and get some fresh air, but it, the importance of connecting ourselves to nature and, um, understanding that our, not only our physical well-being, but our emotional well-being, our mental well-being, our connections to others. I mean, all of these things are wrapped up in, um, the places that we are, that we inhabit. And given the fact that we spend 90% of our time indoors, we need to, we physically need to bring that connection in sometimes. And just a couple of examples, I mean, your, your point about like the hospital room, and, and I had a similar experience with my, my first dog, my first baby. I literally left the hospital a day early because I knew it was, it was actually detrimental to my health to be there because I couldn't sleep, I had no fresh air, I had no views of the outside, you know, the list goes on. And I just said, like, I need to go home. Like, this is actually not helpful to my healing. And there's plenty, and I'm just a sample size of one, and, and now you and I are, are sample size of two. There's actually case study about healing times being amplified and being sped up by just simply a view of outdoors. Um, so that's kind of the, the sort of extreme example. But even thinking about like your ocular health, the ability to have perception, you can look at a screen and obviously we don't wanna do that all day, but even that distance, that, that three foot distance or what have you, like you have to change that up. You have to look 20 feet away to, um, to maintain ocular health. Um, I mean, I can, the sort of the list can go on and on, but bringing nature in is, um, is important. And that's not just, you know, a picture of the outdoors. The biomimicry is actually like 
um, how we design spaces. And I'm looking at my desk, which it is wood, but you know, thinking about it as a desk, it is mimicking the natural pattern of um, of a tree, of 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 the um, the rings around a tree. You, know, you can sort of look around your. Hopefully, you can look around your home and just think about ways that. Um, you know, that we try to bring that natural element because it is, again, it's what we are naturally drawn to. And it, it does provide a level of um, sort of attenuating that stress response. And I had recommended, and I'll just recommend it to the group, a book called um, uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Mm -hmm. And the punchline is because they're not always stressed. They're stressed when they need to be stressed and they're calm when they need to be calm but they're common at all other sort of times. So stress is not a bad thing, but we have to surround ourselves with environments that actually allow us to um, reduce that cortisol uh, release and, and allow us to calm down. So hopefully that's a, an introduction or a, a good kind of just reminder of, of why the importance of, of this biophilia, biomimicry and, and bringing the outdoors in. Mm -hmm. Awesome, yes it does. Um... And then you, you, you started to talk about, um, you know, the space having um, or the space matching uh, the mindset. And in our conversation, you brought, you brought that conversation into neurodiversity, which, yeah, this, I see so many challenges around this. I see so much value in it, but I see the challenges as well. So I think this is a really next, a really healthy conversation to bring in next uh, to the group. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I actually met, or I know a woman named Kay Sargent. She, um, she leads up the sustainability team at, at HOK, and she actually introduced the concept of neurodiversity to me. She is an expert in the, um, in the field, and um, so I, you know, whatever I say is probably just a, a repeat of what I've, I've heard her sort of um, proselytize and, and um, her sage wisdom. But this whole idea that, you know, there is, among us, our, you know, our brains are all wired differently, right? And I, I think it's one in eight people are considered sort of neurodiverse. So whatever that means, um, there's a, a list of kind of, uh, uh, I hate, I, I'm not even, I want to make sure I'm, I'm saying the right terminology, but there's a list of sort of um, mental states that fit into that, namely, um, you know, uh, Asperger's, um, even, well, so anyways, um, so one in eight people are ner considered neurodiverse. Well, only half of those people know it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the majority of, of the neurodiverse population are walking around and they don't know. And I think you had made a point earlier and um, I can't remember if it was when, uh, when you were speaking or um, somebody else. And, oh, you, you're mentioning like getting a high performance, um, uh, setting someone up for sort of high performance is, is when you're giving them the surroundings that don't support that is like a, you know, an umbrella in a hurricane. I would argue it's like sunscreen in a hurricane. Like it's <laughs> literally, or, you know, a wind blower in a hurricane. Like it actually can make things worse. Oh. Um, you know, and, and I don't, I think it's an, um, you know, an Einstein quote, if you ask a, you know, a, a fish to, to climb a tree, like they're going to fail because it's not what they're built for. You have to set people up for success. And Kay actually has a really good quote. Um, we need to ensure that our best assets and the true currency of business people are in spaces where they can thrive. It's in our, all of our worst interests to give people spaces that actually at best inhibit them but at worst actually make them worse performers. Um, and I'm not just saying this from an altruistic, like let's make the world a better place. Of course, that's what we should do. But from a financial standpoint, like why would you hire an employee who you're gonna pay money and who you want to be productive and then put them in a space that they get distracted or that they can't get their work done. And so it's not even a matter of being technically neurodiverse. All of us, throughout the day have different needs. Mm -hmm. And if you have to do focused work, <clears throat> the worst thing you can do is be in an open office that is really loud and noisy. Alternatively, if you need to work on a group project, the worst thing you can do is be in a place where you can't, you know, literally throw things on the wall and write and la be loud and, and collaborate. So understanding how to um, establish spaces that 
are flexible enough to meet just even changing needs of, of a neurotypical uh, person is, is so important. So um, there are definitely challenges and um, I, there's, there's a list of those, but I'm hopeful mm. that COVID, one of the, um, one of the lessons we learned from this pandemic is how to rethink real estate and the way that we use real estate and the, and this sort of typical, you know, be it nine to five work hours, mm. Monday through Friday, in and off. I mean, all of these things, we just, we have to rethink them. Even the types of spaces that we use, we just have to rethink them and be smarter about what we offer people because it's not only more efficient, and it's not only um, better for the climate, you know, if you think about not commuting all at the same time, that's going to be better, but it's ultimately, it's going to be better from a financial standpoint. And so all of us have a vested interest in rethinking this and um, not just kind of going back to, you know, to the status quo. So are there, that's, you, you, you mentioned kind of different, um, different mindsets uh, fitting certain um, tasks or, um, sorry, so, so different spaces fitting so different mindsets and tasks. Is is there a standard number of categories that would satisfy like that a neurodiversity spectrum? I don't think so. I mean, I think this is when kind of post occupancy and pre occupancy surveys become really important and understanding. And I, there's going to be a lot of um, complications if you try to kind of identify your population, i.e. say, you know, raise your hand if you're uh, autistic, like that's not really going to okay. happen. But, but getting at some, like a surrogate indicator, what type of work do you do? And actually we, my company asked us to fill out a survey as we think about coming back into office. And I thought they did a really great job in the sense that they said, how has how has this, you know, working from home situation challenged you? Like, what have you, what have you felt like you couldn't do as well as when you were in the office? And what was fine? You know, what, what didn't have any hiccups? And how, um, was it collaborating that was a problem? Or was it doing your focused work? Or was it, you know, so on and so forth. You can find questions that are, um, again, not necessarily indicative of the type of person, but the type of task that that person is being asked to do, and then sort of look back on spatial design and, and the way that the, that the um, office, for example, is being set up, and make sure that you have ample space for that type of work. So you may, I mean, honestly, you may need one type of space. You might need two types of space. You could need more than that, but um, my guess is you know, once you start to look at an office, you're, it's not, it, there is going to be a, a, a top sort of end to that. And it's not just a, you know, make a space for every individual. There, you will be able to classify into, you know, into group people. Mm -hmm. So then, um, <clears throat> Nick, actually, that would be a good, so uh, the way I'm hearing it is, you know, you're, you're identifying tasks, you're marrying design to the tasks, and but now then you've got the challenge of the design element relating to this, the available space that you have um and nick you've had a lot of experience with that so you man i can't imagine the challenges there um what are some examples of things that you've seen to achieve that wellness within the build environment yeah it's a it's a great question and Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us. Really glad to have your, your knowledge and expertise here. So <clears throat> I picked a couple that, you know, I found really interesting, not only things that have occurred, you know, where I live. I mean, to chat to your point, when you opened up, this was something that I didn't even know existed prior to March, right? <clears throat> and working exclusively with design professionals for 10, 11 years. And so, um, you know, I, I wouldn't think, at least in my mind, locally, there's, there's not this going on. Um, and it's funny that you guys both spoke about hospitals and, and health care. Um, I have a, an article here uh, that speaks to the local children's hospital here in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm in Des Moines, for the record. Um, in some of the uh, patient rooms, they enlarged the windows from 20 square feet to 90 square feet for these children. 
uh, the director of pediatrics and pediatric, pediatric intensive care noted a 15% improvement in patients' ability to manage pain. Uh, the patients also responded to care more quickly by a rate of 25%, um, which I think is uh, unbelievable. And I think that's the, the type of data and statistics as a business-minded human being insurance nerd numbers guy that that's the difference in my eyes. I mean, that's, those are the, the sort of cold, hard facts that start to drive the need for this, um, you know, that has been amplified by us all sitting at home for 20 hours a day uh, for the most part, unfortunately. And so, you know, that's just an example that really strikes me as, as something that was implemented that was simple and, and that um, really created a difference within that organization um, but I'd be lying to, to say that I, I didn't have concerns with the investment that it took to, to implement some of these things, at least from an insider's perspective, um, and, and making sure that that matched the return that you got, right? Again, business mind, insurance, ROI guy. Um, I don't know the cost of larger windows, et cetera, on a day-to-day -day basis, but I did worry about the market response, which is why I got excited when I learned of the IWBI and their efforts with the, the well certification. And then I started to research some of the financial metrics around the return on this, or at least the, the maybe the, not the return, the, the want or the, the need for this, the demand, mm -hmm. uh, a better term of this. And you know, some stats, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, you know, 60% of homeowners are willing to pay more for a healthy home. Ninety-five percent of homeowners consider their health and well-being important in relation to their home, and those are all pre-COVID numbers. I'm sure um, that ninety-five percent now that we're all at home is probably ninety-nine point six. And so I, I think the more that we can kind of create that demand and create an awareness around this as a a mindful practice for design professionals throughout the United States and the world. I think the better off we all will be um, just based on a few random facts here and there. So, so then you will with the, <clears throat> so you brought up COVID. Those were ass assuming those were pre COVID stats. <clears throat> I think it's fair to deduce that the uh, post COVID stats are going to be a lot more significant and those were already significant. Um, but with statistics, we still rarely see action. Um, how do you, how, if you could, uh, if you had a crystal ball, how would you predict the next few years after COVID with, uh, with, um, or a specific reference to, uh, well-being and build? Yeah. I mean, I think to Sarah's point, there is going to be a demand that is driven by commercial property owners, by, by real estate developers, by, homeowners, you name it, that will demand, you know, different aspects of the well-being standard or, or just designing with well-being in mind uh, prior to making investments or, um, you know, when they are real estate development, for example, building a new uh, condominium building, you're not going to build it without considering, you know, access to, um, you know, physical activity, access to safety or, or social equity uh, driving factors. And so I think, I think there will be a, an intense private demand as people reevaluate their spaces coming out of, of COVID. I, our company alone uh, had recently renovated and, and redone about five of our uh, 11 offices over the last three, five years. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to reevaluate them again in the next six months just because we went complete open space. You know, we, we don't really have a lot of empty space or collaboration space that um, fits the flexible needs of many people. And so I think we're going to have to reevaluate that again. And there's been internal discussions to consider what that return looks like and how our, our norm will forever be changed because of this. So let's say, <clears throat> because investment seems to be such a big barrier, if your organization or if you happen to be working at a home um, and you, you can't get an alignment with your team or your organization, what can you do as an individual with your own personal workspace that would help? Some things that people could do now. Yeah. Um, you know, Sarah, I'd, I'd ask you your thoughts on this, but I think 
a big thing for me is, uh, and similar to Sarah, right in front of me and right above me, there's uh, an open window, right? I always, I'm always sure to keep changing that, that focus indoor, outdoor. Um, you know, I, I did paint the inside of my house as well. <laughs> Bright and lighter color, which is so not so not an aggressive salmon, <laughs> right? Yes, um, but uh, but you know I think there are many little things um, that that can be done. And, you know, making sure that the chair you're sitting in isn't you know having an effect on your back. I mean, the one I'm sitting in is terrible, and it's it's I'm definitely feeling it. <laughs> um, you know, the, the physical activity I think is huge. Just, just being mindful of, Hey, have I been sitting here for eight hours and not moved? Right. And so getting out and, and going for that walk, if you can, and taking that time while you have the flexibility to do so from a unique work at home environment, Sarah, anything you would say? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I think there's a, there's a very, very long list. Um, I guess my first word of caution would be, let's, I don't want wellness to be for privileged, right? So the more we talk about the ways that individuals can do it, I think we actually get away from a public health perspective. Mm -hmm. And it is a lot more cost effective if we just, you know, raise the tides, because then we all benefit. And um, yes, there are absolutely ways to, for all of us to, um, to improve our, our individual spaces. But, I, and then the other thing I would say to that is there's risk to that. Like, you know, get a chair that's better for you. Okay, well, what does that mean? And then you could end up in a chair that actually is really harmful to you because someone told you it was ergonomic. But to be honest, like the standards that set uh, you know, sort of the, um, and I won't, I won't sort of throw anybody under the bus, but a lot of them are listed for like a six foot two man. Mm -hmm. I am not a six foot two man. So if I was sold a chair that's supposed to be fitted for me, it's actually not, it's, and could actually do more harm. So I think there's a lot of risk to putting the, to use sort of my term, uh, you know, the term of, of kind of um, blaming the victim, you know, if you're not healthy, it's your fault. Um, and, and not only that, but it's just, it's much more cost effective if we just, and it's not, you know, what I always sort of say about well is particularly if you're designing a new space, it costs the same to build well as it does to build poorly. Hmm. So figure out what works, what is best for all of us, and then just let's make that the standard of design. Um, and then the other piece I would say in, 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 to just sort of reiterate the need for data and um, assurance is if you tell me and sort of getting back to uh, Nick your point about um, you know the ROI whatever it's worth whatever that return is if you Nick were offered a job at a place who could tell you oh I yeah I'm totally taking care of your health and here I have a third party assuring you that you know, ventilation rates are this, air quality is that, light quality is this, and you were assured, you didn't have to trust them, and you left to go to that competitor, what is the, the ROI becomes a moot point because now your company doesn't have you, and your best ideas went with you. So I'm not really sure, you know, we're not going to get to, by the time we know, oh, you know, putting in 90 foot, 90 square inch windows is, cost this and the return is that by the time we get there there's no alpha there's no way to get um to generate a positive return on that it'll just be best practice but in the meantime think about your top talent and again getting back to that offering people spaces that they can be maximized their humanness can be maximized that they're happiest they're going to stick around in that's worth all, you know, all the money in the world because you ostensibly, you hired someone, you want to keep them. Um, and, and so, you know, sort of, I, I take a, a, a little bit of umbrage with the, the ROI calculation just because it's kind of like by the time we get there, it'll be a moot point. Um, but again, that public health mindset of let's make this work for all of us because not only is it the right thing to do, it's actually the most financially cost uh, effective and efficient. That's a, uh, you, <clears throat> Okay, so coming from a guy that's, you know, been at 
independent sports and has always been like, okay, hey, what could I do? To, oh, you just blew my mind. Um, taking the focus off what uh, the individuals can do for themselves and actually tying up the privilege. Amazing point, and it's powerful. And so now we're back to the big elephant in the room. Like, um, any <clears throat> anytime you get accounting involved in a project, they always look or reduce the project to three key things. Profit, and I can't remember the other two. So, um, <laughs> so then Cal, I know you got experience here then. So I guess, how do you, yeah. Well, actually this could be both Cal and uh, Sarah cause you both have experience here. How do you make the owners, the investors believe wholeheartedly that everyone's going to know that this is the right thing to do. And it's clear just with that powerful statement, but to make it financially viable. Dad, thank you very much. And uh, Sarah may not want to self promote. So I'll do a little <laughs> bit of that right now. Nick and I participated in a webinar that Sarah was the moderator for, and it was um, a great topic. It did cover the I issue of ROI. You yeah. had the guest from uh, a large international warehouse, Riot, uh, so a real, investment, a real estate investment trust. They were talking about helping solve customer problems by having an environment that would recruit, so attract and retain employees and to promote health. That Riot had customers in industries known for high turnover, and they were trying to help that company solve the turnover issue to decrease their total cost of employment. Very similar to when we were starting the mental health and suicide prevention initiative, our argument was human capital risk management. Mm -hmm. If it saved one life, I never had to do a single ROI calculation. It became a conceptual argument. And so I think Sarah, that's what I just heard you say. It becomes a conceptual argument because what is the cost to employers now? They're mostly hidden costs and largely in insurance or risk management or other forms, the costs aren't of prevention aren't being captured. They're not being calculated. They don't get allocated. All we have are the direct costs. We rarely have the indirect costs. So all the work I spent years and years ago on risk performance metrics, those leading indicators, current indicators, lagging indicators, became mute points when you were talking about saving someone's life. In this regard, it's the quality of life. Mm. And Sarah has already said, our work from home is gonna change the way real estate thinks. The other things that I think are really important is real estate, it needs to be a long-term view and it's a long-term play. Um, you do have the opportunity to amortize those costs and to spread them and recoup over time. So that's one really key thing. Sarah, I use the term that real estate, it's a competitive landscape or a playing field. And um, there's many ways to neutralize that competitive disadvantage if you're spending more, because you might fill a building faster, you might charge premium rates, you could have less turnover, you could have waiting lists, you could inure these um, reputation benefits by having such a desirable facility, the next time you build, you sell out quicker at premium prices. So Sarah is expert, I'm a generalist, but uh, Sarah, if I'm full of it, you can call me out or you can <laughs> send me an email later. But the last thing that I think is really key, you've got life cycle cost investment. So you've got the opportunity to look at those investments from different lenses, depending on your needs. And this whole concept, Sarah, you're more expert than me, but the ESG, the triple bottom line, as it's called, you've already referenced the sustainability. We're talking about human capital risk management as well. Um, and then the last quick item is the portfolio play. Mm -hmm. So you could have owners with different types of investments that decide to mix and match so they can meet the financial uh, requirements of different people. That does go contrary to, to what Sarah said in terms of rising the tide. You'd love to have this be accessible for everyone. And Nick used the word um, social justice and social equity. But when I look at these factors, I'm like, this to me is one of the most exciting 
developments when we brought it to Nathan and Chad's attention. Um, Nick had that opportunity to do so. We've been offered four articles in this space between next month and uh, February. Sarah is one of the subject matter experts we wanted to reach out to. Then last, there is that pragmatic side. There will be owners that don't want to pay for a certification. There'll be owners who think there's, uh, you know, possibly an economy to be had by not paying a premium for mm -hmm. uh, design enhancements. It's kind of like back in the 70s, there was an oil filter company called Fram and they used the tagline, you can pay me now or pay me later. I think many owners, if they avoid making these investments in well-being, will have to be paying to upscale over time in the short term, maybe doing retrofits, tenant fit outs. So you could have a false economy too by being overly pragmatic. And Nick, mm -hmm. you and I talk about that a lot. So, Chad, uh, I, yes. I hope that's what you were looking for. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Uh, awesome. Um, okay, kind of want to open up the conversation to the group, um, but the, Daniel, I was going to kind of pick on you for a bit here, not really pick on you, but kind of call you out. The, the conversation, I was going to open up, uh, open up to the group, but um, you're at Walsh, and Walsh is a major player, um, been around for over a century, and they, despite the fact that they're an you know, an older company and in their fourth generation of family ownership, they're still leading the pack in progression. So have you seen any well built design uh, in the design process at Walsh yet? Um, so if you're going to pick on me, I'm going to take this opportunity. I, I, I think <laughs> where, where I struggle with well um, is the same way where I struggle with lead. Lead was supposed to be the solution and eco-friendly and all this stuff. And it's, we still don't have buildings going lead and Wells trying to take a different route from that. But maybe it's been, I've been hardened by the construction trailer. Mm -hmm. um, so for hearing well as an office space means nothing to me because I think the construction trailer coffee and construction trailer, you know, press board walls have hardened me as an individual. Um, so having a nice office with trees and everything is great, but my office was always surrounded by dirt and non-existence and got my job done. Worked anywhere from 80 to 100 hours yeah. and, and worked hard at it and everyone else around me worked hard at it. So um, there's almost this duality of you either go hard or you go super friendly and nice and you look at the what Apple's done with their spaceship headquarters and uh, I kind of question did they do that out of the well-being of their employees or did they do that for the bottom line? Because at the end of the day, making their office space extremely inviting now brings in that demand for employees to have a capitalist mindset to work them to the bone because you have a gym here, you have laundry here, you have a food court, you have everything you need. Why would you ever want to leave your office? And are we taking too much of a stance of let's make our offices these happy and well-being environments that everyone can love and be a part of. We have tried to do that in our office space. You know, we've, mm -hmm. we've made it inviting, brought in a lot of natural light. You know, the general employee is not going to get a window. It's still the old guard of your director above, you get a window office, everyone else can have the ambient light. Um, but what we did, we don't have open spaces. And that actually proved to be something beneficial for us because we're 100% back in the office because we have divider walls, we're protected, we're mm. six to six plus feet away from everybody. So um, we're able to do that. We're a lead platinum facility. You know, we don't have well certifi certification on that project, but you know, we see it on owner's demands. But when we're building a high rise, uh, most developers are small apartments. We'll give them nice amenities. We'll give them a pool, a gym, a communal space, but we're gonna charge an arm and a leg for building this stuff. On the flip side with hospitals, everyone's going that route because they're aware mm -hmm. of the wellness. And again, I still think it's more on the uh, capitalistic side. The faster we can get a patient in our hospital and out of our hospital and fill them is going to be the better for us in the long term because we can churn and burn and get more people through the system. And having an environment that's very efficient like that is a very profitable environment. So it sounded more, so it's, it's kind of sounded like as much as investment is a barrier 
it's also the driving force in, in change from, from what we're seeing. Hey, I would agree with that. Amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bianca. Man, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to ask this debate question, but this has just gone in a different direction. Um, might as well make the conversation organic. This is awesome. You studied in Italy and you know you have a degree in um, European architecture so have is there any correlations with anything or like how has it changed over time from your perspective since you're going way back yeah I can almost feel like well because of the times that we're facing right now it's almost like a I just keep coming back to this opportunity state of okay now we've we're forced to pause and a lot of um you know principles that were a part of the renaissance or just taking time to get connected with nature through like the transcendent you know transcendence movement and um tr it's just kind of coming to this point in time where it's like the bigger asks of okay like do we have to always do things like we did in the last hundred years no the last 30 years no right. like now it's and I, I personally my my story is like I've worked from home for the past year so um like I've been through like the gamut I've worked in the field you know in the shanty totally understand Dan's point of like kind of being jaded to like getting your work done and like this is it the coffee is great sure <laughs> like you kind of like make do and it's you kind of get an adrenaline rush off of that so you're like you you've experienced that and then I've worked in like the office environment in the cubes after that and you know almost like you know you get into this escape mode like I can't do this and now I'm here in a remote work setting for the past year and then now everything's amplified with COVID so it's kind of like I've been doing it but yes like I need to still adjust myself and there's a couple other variables happening you know and so in terms of tying it back to the um maybe how things were done before the industrial revolution or you know even like a family setting just getting connected with your families more and how does that translate into work and so it can even i feel like there's a homeschooling movement happening too and maybe mm -hmm. that's okay you know people that have kind of always been curious about it now it's like now is the chance to try it and kind of get more centered in the home and then from a you know, key driver point of how, you know, how do businesses want to operate and drive efficiencies? Um, yeah, like that, you know, what Dan mentioned about the hospital environment, that makes sense for that business. So it's kind of like looking at it from a category of what that business or industry does and what their products are. Um, but the people are critical and just kind of putting the heart to it, I think really kind of will be kind of the story behind this period of time when we look back. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's just all kind of woven together. And I think being in check and in tune with the needs of people are so key at this time. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very humbled by everyone's amazing perspectives on this and like the background stories are incredible. So thanks for sharing with everyone, but yeah. <laughs> awesome. Then, um... And uh, Paul, I mean, uh, Matt, you're involved in planning of actual cities. So, you know, Bianca, giving us a little historical perspective, coming into coming into your perspective, you've got to have some some perspective on this. Oh yeah, um, you guys. Were, I always feel like you know, Zoom has like this little camera looking over our shoulder. This sounds like a lot of the conversations we've been having. Um, I just got out of a three-week think tank with a group called the Digitally Foundation. It's an invitation-only group that gets together outside of Oxford. Uh, and for those of you that are Downtown Abbey fans, that's the actual building that Digitally is. So we usually meet face-to-face, -face, but we've had to do this uh -huh. COVID thing. And some very interesting things came out of it, which gave me some perspective that is right in alignment with uh, you know, the ideas that I'm hearing here. And I think one of the big ones uh, that, that they came out of is that we're in the COVID gym. Um, oh, our breakout room is closing in 56 Oh, one seconds. minute. Hit it. Go. Okay. So, top 
tactical and strategy. We're really at this point right now where these ideas of, of networks and biomimicry are going to be driving this process. But I think one of the things that we have to get in our, in our minds is that this is about products versus projects. And in the AC market, we think uh, too much projects. So with that, let's concentrate on good design. Mm -hmm. And we're about to be kicked off. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> ladies, everyone, this was uh, an awesome conversation. I think from, uh, the only regret is that we didn't have enough time. I think this could have gone on <laughs> forever, literally. Um, and we could have had a phenomenal uh, debate as well with everything from the practicality, the finance perspective, and where it's going at the five-year mark, 10-year mark, and all the years beyond. So thank you for everybody's participation. How rude. Man, that's just, man. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I think we got it in, though. <laughs> <laughs> Practicing yourself.